Well, good morning, everyone, and Merry Christmas to uh, those that may be watching us by way of uh, video this morning. We just finished singing a very, very beautiful song. And um, I think that uh, on Christmas Eve, before I go to preach, uh, we're going to show that video to the folks that are watching us by way of uh, Facebook or YouTube or because it's just beautiful. It's a beautiful song. And I appreciate Barb so much in her work at putting together our worship services. It's not easy because pastor's not easy sometimes because he doesn't give his preaching calendar and she has no idea what I'm going to be preaching on, let alone uh, uh, that so uh, maybe in 2024 I'll get back to giving you a preaching calendar <laughs> uh, but I uh, appreciate the work that you put into this it's not easy and um, uh, back in the day when uh, in the former church I was at um, there were times where I would uh, I had much to my rookiness used to get frustrated with the uh, piano player the musician worship leader uh, well, she played the piano, and she wanted to know the music. What's the music? What's the music? I don't know. I don't know. Just pick something, you know, and I get really nasty and uh, belligerent about it, and other times I would sarcastically give her this list, and because she wanted to practice at home. She said, well, I want to practice, and I said, well, I don't even know what I'm preaching on until, you know, and uh, later on, uh, I realized the lady that did this ministry did it out of the goodness of her heart, and I, as a pastor, needed to show a lot more support and a lot more care. And I so much appreciated Vivian's ministry through the years. And I'm not sure if she's still playing the piano there at the, my former church, but if she is, that's awesome. She was a, uh, just a phenomenal, um, gorgeous uh, music person. And um, um, so I, I came to appreciate what it was to be a worship leader. So thanks, Barb, for your work. And it's even harder because uh, for those that are watching by way of video, they don't know this, but uh, we have a beautiful electronic piano that uh, was just donated to us a while back, but we don't have somebody to play it. Uh, so if you live in the Battleford area, give me a call <laughs> and we could talk about that. Um, but um, we, we sing the videos at, we're like karaoke church. And it's, and it's no surprise, because if you go to our website, it's in there. It says, we sing the videos. So I'm not telling you something out of school. <clears throat> but uh, what Barb picks every week is picked on the theme of what the scripture verse is. And it's hard to do. Some weeks it's like, I have no idea how to get a theme out of this. But somehow she comes up with something. And so we much so much appreciate Barb's willingness to do that. And for you to are watching by way of video, maybe come alongside your worship leader or your piano player, uh, your pianist or your organist, whatever it may be, and just say thank you. But nothing more. Just say thank you for your ministry. It's, it's a lot harder than I think. And then on the other flip side, we have worship leaders that think they're all that in a bag of chips, if not more. And uh, I always ask that the Lord would humble them and make them servants of God and not uh, look at me God at people and uh, so but uh, I, I just appreciate it Christmas is a really busy time of year for a lot of people and um, you know there's just so much going on and it wears us down and um, but you want to know something at Christmas time <clears throat> and uh, you know I'm going to be very transparent with you uh, I personally struggle at Christmas. And I've been struggling ever since I was a little boy. And, and I'll tell you why. Because my father uh, was a pagan man who worked all the way through Christmas driving a taxi. There was a lot of alcohol-induced violence in my home. And so when it comes Christmas time, even though... Uh, that was a long time ago. I, I just, I'm a little off all the time. And uh, a while back, oh, this is a few years ago, I was talking to a counselor. Uh, uh, we had gone through some difficulties here at the church, and I was meeting with them, 
an individual uh, to help me through some of the post-traumatic stress that I felt from this particular issue that we had at the church many years ago. And, and I was telling him about my Christmas issues. And he says, well, you know, Dan, maybe you need to focus on the little things and not so much on the big things. So this morning while I was sitting in the living room, I was looking at her Christmas tree and the lights are blank and green and red, green and red, green and red. There's all these little, little ornaments all over the tree. Many of them handmade, many of them uh, through the years. And I thought, that's cool. That's really cool. Once a year, these ornaments come out and take it for granted. And so today, I, 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 all week long, as I've been thinking about this message, I've been thinking about this whole idea of that um, things that are little mean a lot. Little things. Luke chapter 2, verses 4 to 7 is what we're going to be looking at. And what I want to talk about today is how great, awesome, majestic the Lord is and has a wonderful way of using little possessions, little places, and little people to accomplish his will. And what I mean by little people, I'm not talking about people that are little in size. I'm talking about in stature. They're not the big, you know, up there. They're just the common everyday people. Luke chapter 2, verses 4 to 7 reads, And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. Let's open in prayer. Heavenly Father, I do count it a privilege to be a little person in the bigger picture of life. Thank you, Father, for the reminder to me that Christmas is not about the big things. It's about the little things. It's about the special baking that's made, the special little decorations that are on the tree, um, expression of care by maybe receiving a, a Christmas card that we always get once a year from the same people, but at least they remembered us. Father, thank you for the little things the little places. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. As I was thinking about this message this week, I was reminded about how often in life little things are important. For example, Michelangelo. He's known for his art, and he's known for his, his attention to the minuscule minis details the little details. He calls them trifles. Trifles make perfection, he says, but perfection is not trifle. I remember <laughs> uh, quite a long time ago, I used to think that I was quite the car mechanic and tried to work on my own vehicle, but it never failed. It ended up being on a tow truck going to the gas station to get repaired. So I gave up on that, and I decided I'll just get somebody to fix my car. Well, I thought at one time I would uh, change my own oil. And I unscrewed the oil plug and let the oil drain into the oil collection pan, and then I emptied the old oil into an old container to take, uh, uh, well, in those days, we, uh, I just put it in the garbage, in the garbage, but today take the recycling center. 
Then I took off the old filter and replaced it. No problem. I forgot one detail. I put the thing on. I then put five quarts of oil and poured it into the oil spout. I put my tools up and cleaned up. And when I came back to the car, I noticed that the oil was all over the ground. <laughs> and I looked about and I said, what did I do wrong? I forgot to put the oil plug back in. That's right, sir. <laughs> I give up. That was at that point. I, said, I give up. I will never do this again. An oil plug is about one half to three quarters of an inch in width and long. And it's extremely small in comparison to a huge car. But it's very important that if you're going to put the oil in the car, make sure you got the oil plug on first. And uh, so, I, yeah, I'm just not a mechanic. Little things. Little things can, in fact, play very significant roles in many things in life. For example, the Lord is awesome. He's big. He's powerful. He's astounding. But he seems to delight in getting glory by using the littlest, most mundane, seemingly insignificant things and people. And it's interesting to look at some of the little things in the Christmas story. And some of them are found right here in Luke chapter 2, verses 4 to 7. Let's take a look at some of these little things. First of all, the Lord uses little possessions. Little possessions. Let me get my fancy pen out here and I'm going to show you some things here. I want to make sure I get the color right though first. So just, just ignore me while I do this. I should have done it before, but I didn't. There we go. I'll erase that. There. In Luke chapter 2, at the beginning of the verse, so we're talking about here to here. Jesus, the king of the universe, this baby, was not wrapped in silken colorful garments befitting his glory that would clothe a prince of royalty he was clothed in swaddling clothes swaddling clothes were the common cheap plain white fabric used by the peasants the poor the common people and I suggest to you, though, the Lord using a little possession for his glory is nothing new. <laughs> All through the Bible, we see that the Lord used little possessions for his service and glory. For example, it was a little sling that killed mighty Goliath with little tiny rocks. In Judges 3, there's a gentleman by the name of Shamgar. Shamgar. He killed 600 Philistines with just a little ox goad, which was a rod used to guide oxen. Stick. Moses parted the Red Sea with a simple rod, which was probably a shepherd's crook when he slapped the ground and the water parted. The widow in the New Testament who gave two mites, but its value was far greater than the much larger gift of the rich man, for she gave her all. Jesus had need of a little colt to ride triumphantly through Jerusalem. The little boy had only five loaves and two fishes to feed the 5,000. There's a poem that I found this week. It goes like this. To Christ my Lord and King, no, help, no wealth, no might, no wisdom, no noble gift to bring. Five loaves and two small fishes? But what, alas, are they among the throngs of hungry who crowd life's troubled way? Five loaves and two small fishes. Not much, my friend, tis true. 
but yield them to the master and see what he can do. Placed in his hands of mercy, thy little will be much. Tis not the gift that matters, but his mighty touch. You see, the Lord uses little possessions. Secondly, the Lord uses little places. Luke chapter 2, verse 7, towards the end here. It says here, because there was no room, place for them in the inn. It may come as a surprise to know that many homes of the rich in that day had many conveniences that at that time would be called modern. In that time, they had, cotton, they had hot and cold running water, not like how we have it today, but um, they found ways of making hot water. Uh, I remember uh, reading an article about how many homes in Mexico have hot water in their homes. They put a barrel on their roof, and they heat the water, and then they push a faucet and down comes the hot water into their house. And then they fill it back up again. I didn't know that. They had spigots for pouring water, for pouring wine. Even sauna baths. But the Lord did not use an opulent place for the place of the birth of the King of Kings. Instead, the Lord chose, and some suggest, a little cave, or perhaps it was a small barn, because our text tells us that Mary laid him in a manger. Laid him in a manger. A manger was a feeding trough for livestock. We see that throughout the scriptures, the Lord used humble little places for his glory. It was in a little obscure town called Bethlehem that Jesus was born. The Last Supper took place in an obscure, borrowed room. Jesus was buried in a borrowed tomb. You see, the Lord uses little possessions and little places for his glory. Thirdly, most importantly, the Lord uses little people. What do I mean by little people? Think about this for a moment. When you think of the Christmas story, it was not the wealthy, the educated, the religious, or the influential to whom the angels brought tidings of great joy in the Christmas story. story. It was a group of insignificant, lowly shepherds, little people. It was not fashionable, beautiful, wealthy, elite lady of nobility who was chosen to bear the baby Jesus. It was an ordinary peasant woman, actually, peasant teenager. Her name was Mary. The Lord did not choose a rich, leisurely nobleman to be the head of the family into which Jesus was born. Rather, Joseph was a simple, hard-working carpenter who made a living working with his hands in the sweat of his brow. 1 Corinthians 1, 27 and 28 says, But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are. See, this reality that the Lord uses simple, low-key people is illustrated many other times in the Bible. David was a shepherd boy. Moses was the son of a common slave woman. Paul was a short, homely man with poor eyesight. Many of the great men in church history were what I call little people. 
I think of some of the great people that we've known in our, gener in, in our time. Martin Luther was the grandson of a peasant and the son of a copper smelter. The great 19th century evangelist D.L. Moody was a farmer's son who later moved to the big city and became a shoe salesman. William Carey, the founder of the modern mission movement, was a simple shoe cobbler. One of the most beloved evangelists of one of the denominations out there called the Nazarene has a gentleman that is very well renowned within there called Uncle Bud Robinson. And Uncle Bud Robinson is a preacher with no more than an elementary education who spoke with a lisp, but who had God's evidence power upon his life to make that denomination of Nazarenes a very powerful and amazingly moving movement. There's another group of churches out there called the Methodists. And one of the most powerful, one of the most colorful evangelists used by the Lord among the Methodists in the 19th century, England was a gentleman by the name of Gypsy Smith, who, as you may have guessed, was a gypsy. <laughs> he had no formal education. I think of some of the wonders of our today. If you were to look at some of the most powerful people in church life today and find out where they come from, many of them come from very humble, humble beginnings. These and many other men and women are just simple, everyday people. What I call little people who were chosen by a big God. And the truth of the matter is that the business of the Lord's work has always mostly been carried out by just average, ordinary, <laughs> little people, most of whom were never famous or recognized for their contributions. But that's okay. Because it's just a joy to be a little person used by a very big God. In simple, basic terms, what I'm saying is that there is a place for every single one of us in the service of the Lord, no matter what our quirks or incapacities are, if we will just give ourselves wholly and completely to the Lord, and if we love Him with all our heart and with all our soul and with all our mind, then let us just get busy in the work of the Lord. I consider it a great honor to be a little pastor in a little church with little people. But you want to know something? We are being used by a big God through our life and through our ministry. There's a song I heard recently. I was visiting a church and uh, I don't know what was the context, but during the message, during, uh, not the message, but during the meeting I had, they sang this song, it's called Little Is Much. Listen to these words. In the harvest field now ripened, there's a work for all to do. Hark, the voice of God is calling to the harvest calling you. Little is much when God is in it, labor not for wealth or fame. There's a crown, and you can win it if you'll go in Jesus' name. May we remember the Lord uses little possessions, little places, little people. Yes, even regular people like you and me. And in conclusion, how can we apply this little thought in our lives personally? Well, first of all, we need to ask ourselves the question, what little possessions do you have to use for the Lord's service and glory? Well, pastor, that's a good question. What do you mean? What kind of things do I have, little possessions that I have, that you suggest that I can use for the Lord's service and glory? Do you own a car? Yeah. You can bring visitors to church. 
Grandpa Fry had a van that he did um, tile. He was a tile layer. He laid tile his whole life. He was a, if you look it up, he was a uh, vegan home child brought over from England by the Canadian government, bought by the Canadian government. And this is a true story. And he came over as a little boy, tiny little boy, to work the farms of Ontario and was sold along with the cattle and wherever it was. And Mr. Fry had no education. He played a trumpet and he um, laid tile. If you go to the University of Toronto and look in the floors and some of the older buildings, the University of Toronto, all those floors were laid somewhere along the line by Mr. Victor Fry. Mr. Victor Fry, he would say, take this ruler and show me where it's out. He prided himself on the fact that there was not one spot where that tile was out. And this gentleman wouldn't cross his legs. He laid his legs flat out on the floor back like this. Anyways, he had this van. And he would pull, it, pull it, all his tiles in there during the weekday. Just fill it up. And then he would go to his jobs. Saturday night, he would take everything out of this van. Absolutely everything. And he laid benches in it. And he would drive around and pick up his Sunday school class and other people's Sunday school class. And at Christmas time, he used to put little wreaths around the uh, outside. Just little wreaths. And he had it all decorated. He's a little guy who did huge work for the kingdom of God in Toronto. So if you have a car, you can bring visitors to church. Do you have a phone? I ha hardly know anybody in the world that doesn't have a phone, either in their house or in their hand. Matter of fact, you're, if you're on watching by way of video, you might even be watching it, this video on your phone. Well, what can you do? You can invite people to church or to encourage a Christian brother or sister who's going through some struggles. Talk to somebody. Call them up for no reason. Do you have a computer? Yeah? You can do lots of things on that. You could help out the church office maybe. Do some uh, freelance work for the church free of charge. Do some stuff. Maybe update their website. Maybe make them a website. Um... Talk to people, be on Facebook, connect on Facebook, whatever it may be. Do you have a musical instrument? Do you, do you, do you play a clarinet? Do you play a trumpet? Do you, do you play a guitar? Whatever it is, a musical instrument. You can bring it to church to bless others. Do you have a pen and a piece of paper? How about sending somebody a note of gratefulness? For someone's ministry in your life. Got a computer? Get on the email there and send somebody an email and say, you know, I appreciate the work that you do on behalf of the church family or whatever it may be. Do you have money? Do you have like, you know, do you have a bank account? Yeah, I do. Okay. All of us can tithe or offer the Lord some financial compensation. Those online, they can go to our website and they can see how to do that if they want to do that. It's a little thing, but it's big. Because when it's multiplied over and over and over, it can be used for big things for the Lord. Thus, you can use your little possessions for our big God and watch him multiply their value. Secondly, when you think of little places, the, th the thing that will mostly likely come to mind is your home. What do you mean? How, how is your home a place for the Lord's service and glory? Well, you ever thought of inviting somebody over for cup of coffee? 
Maybe it could become a place of hospitality. Maybe you could use it to host a, a Bible study. It could become a place for what I call friendship evangelism, where you can reach out to your neighbors and your co-workers and your friends and, and no agenda, just come to visit. It could become a place for hospitality to fellow church members when you can encourage one another and meet one another's needs. It could be a place to open your home for a small group Bible study, uh, maybe some kind of prayer breakfast, maybe teen activities, things like that. Uh, your little home could become a big place in God's scheme of things. I remember one of the things I used to look forward to as a teenager when I first came to Christ is going after church on Sunday nights, going to different youth homes. And there was one house that I used to go to, and it was Kenny Montgomery's house. Kenny was a neighbor of mine, and his mother made the coolest things. She made pancakes with strawberry jam on them. She, and she, I thought that was so cool, these little tiny little pancakes with strawberry jam. Never saw that before. I don't know. My mom didn't do that kind of stuff, I guess. I don't know. And I would just eat this and then she'd give me a bag to take home with me oh I loved it and we would sing songs and I had no idea what we were singing but we sang songs we played silly sock games and silly games and whatnot and then sometimes the youth group would go out to this guy's retreat uh, to his farm out in the mission area north on Hatsik Road way up there in the up there, I can't remember exactly where it was. And I remember as a little boy sleeping in a cardboard box. Big, huge box. This box was the size of this pulpit. And I climbed inside and down the bottom and, and I uh, had a pillow in there and I go to sleep in there. Mr. Callahan he had this farm. And we got to ride horses. These are like early days of me becoming a Christian. Don Philip and his infamous hikes. Remember those? He'd take us out hiking all over the place. We'd sit in the back of his Datsun pickup truck with his big, huge dog. And the dog was tired. He'd growl and snap and he'd get all nervous. And we were all really quiet. He liked that. But we would go to places like that. You see, God uses little things to be used for a big God. Finally, how can we as ordinary people, us little people, be used in big ways by our big God? You know what? Simple. By being available. There are no big jobs in the local church. But all the little jobs we as ordinary people do cumulatively act up, add up to some big things for God. A church that ministers to others and reaches out to the lost world. Just doing simple things like picking up garbage when you see it or having cleanup days and arriving and coming. There's so much little things that we can do to, that make the bigger picture look great. That's why it's so vitally important to get plugged into some area of service in the local church and I appreciate a church family that really uh, does a lot around here but I'm talking more to those who are watching us by way of video uh, maybe step up and get involved in a church just in simple ways you see the strong Christian is always a serving Christian the happy fulfilled Christian is always a serving Christian you see happiness and joy are not found through getting but giving giving of ourselves giving of our bodies to the work of the Lord giving of our talents giving to our acts of love and concern and kindness and at Christmas time more than any other time of year we should be giving because we, receive, we also receive gifts. So what will you give Jesus today? What will you give him this day? Bottom line. In England, in addition to some of the Christian Christmas carols we Amer uh, North Americans sing, the British have a number of other ones not so well known 
uh, here in Canada, in the United States, in North America. One of them that I found is called In the Bleak Midwinter. It begins rather oddly with a picture of a cold world of snow in Bethlehem, something nowhere found in the scriptures, but it goes on from there. Here's what it says. It says, in the bleak midwinter, frosty wind made moan. Earth stood hard as iron, water like a stone. Snow had fallen, snow on snow, snow on snow, in the bleak and midwinter long ago. The second verse is more scriptural. It introduces the angels and Mary. But the third verse is what I want to touch our hearts on here as we go forward. It says, what can I give him, poor as I am? If I were a shepherd, I would bring a lamb. If I were a wise man, I would do my part. Yet, what can I give him? Give him my heart. To me personally, that is the greatest thing you can give to the Lord. No matter if you are mighty or blue collar or general or private, rich or poor, have you given the Lord your heart? You see, the heart in the Bible is the seat of your affections. It, it's what animates you spiritually. It's the real you. And to give the Lord your heart is to give everything to him, to make him your master. And it all begins by being what the Bible calls being, quote unquote, saved. One is saved by turning from sin to Jesus to save us from our sins. Giving the Lord our heart is an ongoing thing because all too often our affections turn to the things of the earth instead of the Lord and things above. So we have to constantly evaluate our priorities. Make sure the Lord is at the center of our lives. We need to determine if we have allowed sin to creep into our lives that needs to be confessed and forsaken. We need to reorient our lives to obedience and discipleship. And for the believer, that's how we can give the Lord our heart. So you can give our Lord your heart by coming to knowing him as your personal savior. Or if you know the Lord as your personal savior by living an obedient and discipled life. So may the Lord work in each of our hearts and help us surrender our possessions, our homes, <coughs> excuse me, even our very lives to the Lord to be used for his glory. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the opportunity I've had of opening the word of God here today. And Lord, may we learn and understand that God can use a little, little insignificant things in our lives. Lord, may we find a way this week to apply this message by helping out someone in need by maybe giving uh, gifts of finance or gifts of something to someone in need. Lord, thank you for the reminder that we have that we were paid, that, our, that you were, your son was born to die, shed his blood for the remission of our sins, is now seated at the right hand of the Father, interceding for us. Lord, may we remember that this is an important time. And I know that it's a very busy time for a lot of families. I think especially those who have elementary school children and all the elementary school stuff that goes on this time of year. And, and those in high school who have all sorts of sports and then there's also just things that they're involved in. Lord, may we slow down and remember the reason for the season and spend time in reflectiveness of realizing the importance of the Christmas story. And so, Father, we commit it to you. We thank you for all that are present here at church today and, and for those who have uh, connected with us over Facebook, YouTube, or the website. And I just pray, Father, that you would give us all a week of opportunities 
to minister. We ask this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Amen.